we can start now i'll give a short introduction once the recording starts okay so hello everyone to this 10th uh, and final talk of our series um today we have dr tomin james um he is currently a postdoc at the paris observatory and he did his iphd uh, from iser pune and graduated in 2019 uh he did it under dr professor prasad subramanian um he works on the uh, solar corona and uses uh, data from uh, nasa and esa satellites um to fit theoretical models and better understand the our sun uh, as a second field of study he also studies artificial artificial intelligence and applies machine learning algorithms to various research problems so with this short introduction i'll let him begin his talk um yeah thank you uh, let me just share my screen now is the presentation visible uh yes Hello. it is yeah it is okay um yeah uh, okay uh thank you for giving me this opportunity and it's really uh, nice to join you guys uh so today my talk would be mainly about the work that i am doing here as well as i'm working on in academia during my phd days as well as uh, i'm share some uh, thoughts about my journey through iser and Uh, and the whole journey of becoming an astronaut um uh, i i hope at least you guys uh, you know, would be uh, uh, curious to know more about heliophysics uh, after this talk and uh, i hope i can convey the excitement of studying on your star okay so the topic for today's talk would be uh, the coronal heating uh using radio emissions particularly now uh um, solar heliophysics is a very uh, vast topic uh, in itself there are many sub topics that you can study um, i will not go in detail into most of the things so just to uh, take you guys on speed i will introduce some basic concepts which might be able to understand later part of the talk um so sun is our nearest star and uh, carries might important to the day we live our life both from a technical view point as well as from a scientific view point um you might see the sun as a very quite beautiful star in wide light images but sun is nothing quite that uh, it's a very explosive star very explosive and it's also very explosive processes uh, it can emit very highly energetic particles uh, into the heliosphere heliosphere which can affect life on earth um other point of studying sun is purely because of the closeness uh, to this astronomical body it is the nearest star uh, and it's an average star and by average what i mean uh, more than um, uh, of the 1 billion trillion stars that in the universe uh sun resembles uh the sun lies in the other spectrum close to most of them so by, so by studying sun and the different processes that uh, is particularly evident in the sun uh we can try to understand about other stars which are like really really far away and which we might find some difficulty in collecting proper data um so sun is a massive of the a very massive object and uh, uh, it carries around 99.8% of the uh, mass of the entire solar system it is around 100 times uh, in uh, uh, bigger than the um, earth in uh, radius and around 300,000 times uh, massive than the earth now uh, and and uh, sun plays a very important role in regulating the conditions that are suitable for uh the life to evolve in uh, on earth so it, it sure uh, plays a very important role in the way that we are right now and definitely in the way that we are going to be in the future so uh, i will just give a brief 
outlook on the different layers of the sun. Uh, so the main energy source for the sun comes from the nuclear fusion, which happens at the core. Uh, at the core, around um, 600 million tons of hydrogen is fused into helium every second. Um, um, now, this energy is needed to affect the hydrostatic equilibrium. So the gravitational forces which is pressing down uh, on the sun is balanced out by this radiation pressure. Now, moving out of the core, uh, we enter into this zone called radiative zone where uh, the sun rotates as a solid body and the heat uh, uh, which is produced in the, uh, the energy which is produced in the core is transported out in the form of radiation. And as we move further out, uh, we reach around 70% of the total radius of the sun and that's where the convective zone starts. In the convective zone, this plasma has already cooled down and the heat is now transported in the form of convection uh, so that there is an orderly transfer of heat in the form of mass transfer all the, all the way from uh, the start of the, at the end of the radiative zone out into the photosphere. Now in between the radiative zone and the convective zone lies a very thin layer called the tackle line um, where the differential rotation of the sun takes place. Now the sun is not a solid body, it is made out of, made out of uh, hot, uh, it's, it's a hot blob of plasma and um, uh, the, the, the rotation at the equator region is faster than that of the polar region. And what it means is the time it will take for a blob of plasma to complete a um, rotation around the sun, around the equatorial, equatorial region is around six days uh, uh, less than that of a polar region. And uh, later we will see how this tackle line is very important for the generation of magnetic field and how this magnetic field in fact play the most important role uh, for different dynamical processes that we actually observe in the sun. Now moving further out into the convective zone, we reach this outermost layer called the photosphere, which is a layer that we will see during, uh, if, if you observe the sun using a wildlife filter and using a naked eye, of course. Uh, and, and, um, uh, the photosphere, uh, after, after the photosphere, the sun extends uh, in the form of different uh, atmospheric layers, uh, all of which is obscured by the bright light of the photosphere. Uh, so the main, main region of the sun uh, on which we will lay our focus to is the uh, outermost layer of the sun called the corona, which is the uh, least dense layer of the photosphere, uh, of, sorry, of the sun, and also the region which carries the most important to a lot of processes that uh, affect the heliospheric space, that is the space which encompasses the uh, sun and all the planets around it. Now, as I said, uh, the magnetic field plays a major role in the different dynamical processes that we see on the sun. Uh, and the, the way in which magnetic field is produced in the form of solar dynamo, it's because of uh, the differential rotation of the tackle line, what happens is uh, the magnetic field is dragged along the plasma. Now, this is because of a property called, uh, uh, called flux freezing, um, and this happens in highly conducting uh, plasma fluids. Uh, so, in highly conducting plasma fluids, what happens is the magnetic field is anchored into the plasma. So, uh, the amount of flux that you might see in a particular blob of plasma, it's conserved over time. And what that means is, 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 is the plasma moves along, the magnetic field is dragged along with it. Now, this gives rise to a uh, well-defined uh, close to 11-year cycle called the solar cycle. Now, at the start of the solar cycle, which we call the solar minimum, uh, the field is uh, colloidal, as you can see from here. The colloidal field is maximum and the toroidal field is now, uh, as time goes by, because of the differential rotation, the plasma tracks along the magnetic field line and the uh, original colloidal field becomes more and more colloidal. And as time goes on, it reaches a stage where uh, from a dipolar setup, it reaches into a multipolar setup and the field is mostly toroidal and very less colloidal. And this phase is called the solar maximum. Now, um, this cycle, which is from the solar minimum to solar maximum takes around uh, 
uh, is around 11 years, and this forms the uh, this, and this is part of the larger book of latent cycle, which is around 22 years. Uh, so it takes 22 years for the sun to uh, start from an initial uh, stage, let's say, uh, with a particular polarity, and return back to the same polarity. Uh, at, at the uh, at the solar maximum, what happens is the polarity of the sun reverses, and the same process happens for the next 11 years as the sun reaches back to the original polarity mode. Now, this process can be visualized using the data that we observe. So, what you see on the screen right now is a visualization of the magnetic field uh, extrapolated using magnetogram images of the sun. So, if you look closely, you can see uh, the gray uh, globe, which is the sun, and this is actually the magnetogram images of the sun. The, um, uh, the white and the black regions are the opposing polarities, polarities that we see on the sun. Um, now, if you interpolate, uh, the magnetic field uh, uh, used from this magnetogram images using a technique called potential field interpolation, you will get some something like this. Uh, so, if you can look closely in, in the uh, beginning of a cycle, the field is usually a dipolar. Uh, doesn't matter which uh, color the magenta and the green represent. Uh, so let's say the magenta is positive and the green is negative. So uh, yeah, in the start of the cycle, it, it, it starts in a very uniform, uh, uh, in a dipolaric sense. And as time goes by, the closed white lines, sorry, the white lines which represent closed field get all mixed up and in, entangled. And uh, you can see the formation of multipolar regions uh, at the time of solar maximum. So this entire uh, Time sequence it covers one entire solar cycle, so it's pretty cool. But the point to note is that to understand um, any process on the sun, it, it's very critical to understand how the magnetic field behaves. So, and and that should be the takeaway point from the slide. Now, um, let me come to the main uh, topic of today's talk, uh, which is the solar atmosphere. Now, uh, as I said before, uh, the solar atmosphere is completely obscured by the bright light from the, uh, from the uh, photosphere. Now, and, and, and because of that, solar atmosphere was, uh, was originally possible to study only when there was a total solar eclipse. During total solar eclipse, the main disk of the sun is covered by the shadow of the moon. And when that happens, the bright light of the photosphere is completely blocked out. And because of that, now you can trace the uh, the, the matter and trans in different magnetic field lines in the solar atmosphere, and this thin diffusion uh, diffuse layer that you see with bright uh, light emission, uh, free emission is what we call the corona. But very close to the disk of the sun, you can see uh, a pinkish hue, which is because of the H-alpha line, and this is called the chromosphere. And as we move further away from the chromosphere, we uh, enter into the corona, and the corona slowly diffuses into solar wind, which is uh, breathing past the uh, breathing past through the heliosphere uh, every time. Um, so this is just basically a depiction of what I just previously. So uh, the, this is the disk of the sun; it is covered by the moon. Uh, the this, uh, pinkish here is here is the chromosphere, uh, and you, as you move move further out, you enter into uh, uh, corona, there is this lower corona, and this lower corona extends into a uh, higher corona, and which further extends into, uh, which, which further forms the solar wind. Now, the interesting fact to note here is uh, uh, at the outermost visible layer of the sun, which we call photosphere, the temperature is around 6,000 Kelvin. Uh, but as we move further out, into the uh, atmosphere, solar atmosphere, we expect the temperature to drop, but no, the temperature increases. So, this is 6,000 Kelvin, the temperature increases to 10,000 Kelvin. Now, this is counterintuitive, and even more strangely, as we move further out, the temperature increases from 10,000 Kelvin to 1 to 2 million Kelvin. So, that is 200 times hotter than the temperature at the uh, photosphere. Now, the layer uh, that is the solar atmosphere is very less dense compared to that of photosphere. 
so that's the reason uh, even though this flare is pretty hot we don't see it uh, because the actual intensity of light that is coming out of it is also pretty small now the interesting question uh, is what is heating up the corona because something has to heat up because if you'd expect that you move, move further away from a hot body the temperature to drop uh, this whole phenomenon is found in youtube and which seemingly violates the second law of thermodynamics now this phenomenon is uh, uh, no recent discovery uh, it was discovered way back in 1942 uh, when people reanalyzed some data that is taken from previous um, solar uh, the solar eclipse emissions, mm, uh, people realized the presence of highly ionated iron uh, uh, and uh, calcium. So the only way these ions can uh, form is if the temperature is around, is around 1 to 2 million Kelvin. So for the past eight decades, uh, it, it's a very puzzling uh, problem that is that has kept many physics. Um, now, major progress has been made in understanding why this is so, but we still don't have uh, a complete answer, and I will uh, try to give an overview of uh, where the field is headed and the progress that we have made till now. Uh, the graph that you see here is basically the same thing, uh, 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 like pictured with the temperature and intensity. So you can see the temperature uh, staying around constant uh, immediately after you move away from the photosphere. And then there is a sudden uh, rise in the temperature, which we call the transition length. And around the same time, the density also sees a major drop. Now, as I said before, the magnetic field plays a major role in affecting the dynamics of the solar atmosphere. Uh, now, one major quantity that we need to care about here is the uh, plasma beta parameter, which is the ratio of uh, the thermal pressure to that of magnetic pressure. And in uh, corona, most of the corona, this plasma beta parameter is less than one. What that means is matter obeys what the magnetic field dictates and not the other way around. So the matter, the plasma matter is uh, aligned with the magnetic field and uh, it cannot move independently of the magnetic field because uh, the magnetic pressure is higher than that of the thermal pressure. Um, and one another thing that you should note is there are these open magnetic field lines. And by open magnetic field lines, we don't mean they're open because that means there would be uh, it's not equal to zero, but what it means is for essential purposes, at least till Earth, this magnetic field doesn't close. Of course, this magnetic field is closed, but maybe like very far into the heliosphere. Uh, so what it enables is for the particle transport, which might happen either by explosive phenomena on the on top of the sun, or maybe because of other acceleration phenomena on the sun, these particles are transported across these magnetic field lines, and they find a ready connection to near Earth. Now, uh, because the magnetic field line dictate how the matter behaves, uh, actually, there are different regions within the corona itself. Uh, the hottest region in the corona is called the active region, and this is where almost all of the interesting phenomena, like solar flares, EMEs, uh, um, and or like other uh, explosive phenomena happen usually. Uh, so, uh, and, and what you see here uh, in in, uh, in maybe uh, UV uh, wavelength as active region here, if you dig back down in the photosphere, you will find a sunspot. So, the sunspot, this, this is basically right about the sunspot. And uh, this is a region of intense magnetic activity. Now, uh, the less active region, which unimaginably we call white region, is where it's it, it, uh, less hotter than the active region. By less hotter, what we mean is the amount of heat that could be put into this part of the corona is lesser than active region. For example, active region, to maintain the observed temperatures, you need to put in around 10 to the power 6 ergs per centimeter square per second. But in, in, in uh, quiescent region, it is around 
around 10 to the power 4 perks per centimeter square per second or 10 to the power 5 uh, perks per centimeter square per second. And for the route, uh, where I in, uh, in the around the polar region to the sun, we find what is called the coronal pole. Now, coronal holes are areas where there is open magnetic field line. And because it's open, the hot plasma that is generated from corona is readily escaped through the open magnetic field line. And uh, comparatively, when you look from uh, Earth, this region uh, has less hot plasma than the surrounding regions, and they appear darker. Uh, so the net energy balance equation is what is given here. That is the, the thermal and the radiation load uh, of the heat, the corona, should be balanced by the net energy input. And only uh, when that happens, uh, the corona is uh, the corona can be maintained in the temperature uh, that we observe. And finding this candidate, which is able to put this kind of heat into the corona, is the major goal of solving the corona heating problem. Uh, excuse now, me. Yeah. So in the previous slide, you have that uh, you had that energy balance equation, right? There you had the lambda of t. Uh, what is the lambda? Um, so it's a it's a conductive term. So um, so which which we involve a lot of other constants uh, into. Uh, but uh, this is specifically speaking, this uh, is not a global energy equation. As I said, this is a very specific magnetic field uh, dependent energy equation. So this is solved along the magnetic field line and not globally uh, uh, on the on on across the sun. So uh, so. This, this particular constant does this varies across different different regions of the sun. Thanks. So, um, so because of uh, yeah, uh, so if, uh, over these many years, what uh, because of the uh, advances in uh, observation capabilities, the uh, uh, that we have developed. Now we know that there can be multiple uh, modes of heating. Uh, so, originally, uh, it was thought because the corona is populated by magnetic field lines, uh, and because the magnetic field line is capable of transporting heat in the form of waves, and um, different magnetoacoustic wave modes are possible uh, in this magnetic field line. The energy from the uh, solar photosphere uh, to different layers of the corona is transferred in the form of magnetic waves. Now, one major problem in, with this particular heating uh, mechanism is the slow dissipation of the heat. Uh, this form of heating will not be able to uh, explain uh, why uh, the, the solar corona can be uh, can have this kind of temperature. So to maybe overcome this limitation, people actually Parker uh, proposed this nano flare heating. In nano flare heating, uh, which I will explain uh, in detail in later slides, um, is basically where magnetic field lines uh, in the um, cancel each other using magnetic reconnection, and these small small energy episodes uh, actually uh, result in uh, the conversion of magnetic energy into thermal or kinetic energies, which in turn heats up the corona. Um, why nano flare heating? Uh, to understand that, you need to understand uh, the observed uh, uh, distribution of the uh, heating events that we observe on the sun. So, what you see on the top panel uh, uh, is basically the solar flares that we observe, observe. on top of this orange line, which denotes the number of transports uh, uh, across the okay, years. Now, the, the solar flares that you see here is actually measured using a uh, soft X-ray instrument on board uh, GOES satellite. I mean, um, the only thing that you need to know here is the different classes of the flare that exist. And these classes are formed by looking at the flux that is measured at the peak of, the, of, of this flare. So the major flares, which we call the X class flares, which are the dangerous ones, which are capable of knocking down our power grid and causing problems to astronauts in uh, lower orbit, uh, as well as Atlantic flight, uh, North Atlantic flight. So 
these ones uh, are pretty rare. So in every solar cycle, maybe 10 to 15 of them will be observed. Now, uh, then comes the M-class flares. They are much more common than X-class flares, but still pretty rare. The, the most common ones are the C-class flares. And uh, below that, and why there is an artificial cutoff here is because the sensitivity of the instrument only measures uh, the C-class flares or the B-class flares much more efficiently. Of course, there are flares which emit even uh, smaller amounts of flex down the lane. But uh, because of the sensitivity to the instrument, it's much more easier to measure the C-class and B-class flares. But the point to note here is that uh, the smaller flares, the smaller explosive events are much more common than the bigger flares. Now, the bigger flares, they emit enormous amount of energy. Actually, a big X-class flare is one of the most explosive events in, uh, in the nearby universe for us, maybe. Uh, so it, 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 it emits around 10 to the power 32 ergs uh, per second. So that, that is enormous amount of energy. But they happen maybe 10 to 15 times per solar cycle. So it cannot account for the steady uh, amount of heating that we observe uh, uh, experimentally. Uh, so this power graph then uh, tells us that if you want to solve the coronal heating problem, you, you need to actually look uh, in the lower regime. Uh, flare where the amount of energy that it uh, emits is around 10 to the power 9 times smaller than the bigger for the flare. And because this is 10 to the power 9 uh, smaller, billion times smaller, these are conveniently called nano flares. Now, uh, yeah, you can see as you move further uh, to the left of this graph, the power low uh, measurement the measurement, which measures the number of events, becomes smaller and smaller. That's because we are testing the current limits of sensitivity of the instrument. So the bigger ones, uh, they are very rare, but they're very easy to do that. They're very easy to measure. But the smaller ones, they're very common. But with the current technology that we have, it's pretty difficult to measure them. Now, um, I will explain how the basic theory that we think is behind the formation of nano flares. So the video the, that you see here on the left hand side is basically the convective motion of the photosphere that you see. Uh, this is basically hot plasma rising to the convective zone, uh, bubbling over the photosphere, cooling down, and then cooling back down. So these white, bright yellow regions are the hot plasma that's coming up from deep down the uh, convective zone. And the darker region uh, that you see is uh, the uh, the uh, cool down plasma singing back down. So, but the uh, because of this convective motion of the plasma, what happens is the magnetic field lines, which are already attached to uh, this surface, is dragged along uh, in this random walk kind of fashion. Uh, and this is because, as I mentioned before, uh, before. Uh, the the uh, the flex is frozen to the plasma, so when the plasma moves, the magnetic field is dragged with it. So as you can imagine, imagine uh, a, a, a photospheric magnetic field uh, at t is equal to zero, starting in a relaxed manner. But as time goes by, because of this random walk kind of motion uh, uh, that this magnetic field undergoes due to this convective motion of the plasma block, they become entangled with each other. And as time goes by, uh, uh, this uh, this entangling motion reaches a critical stage because you cannot endlessly build up energy. The energy has to dissipate. Now, uh, what the theory which motivates nano uh says that uh, once it reaches a critical angle uh, of this entanglement, they reconnect, and this potential energy which was stored in them due to the convective, the work done against the magnetic field is released in the form of free magnetic energy. Uh, this magnetic energy can be calculated roughly for uh, uh, an average uh, size of a magnetic field tube that is around 10 to the power 24 Earth and 
uh, this particular amount is around, as I said before, a billion times smaller than uh, a big flare, and hence the name nano flare. Now, this particular theory was motivated by uh, Eugene Parker in a series of papers in 1980s. Now, uh, Parker is a legendary physicist, actually a very legendary plasma physicist, who also postulated uh, uh, the the existence of solar wind. So, uh, the the recent mission by NASA to study the sun called the Parker Solar Probe, which is going to be the closest man-made object to that of sun, to the, to sun. It's named after him. So uh, NASA almost, and NASA is the first time NASA is naming a, a spacecraft uh, based on living uh, Um Now, all the emissions that you see, which might happen because of the energy release in solar flares, uh, heats up the plasma, and the different plasma temperatures that might be there can be observed using the different, different wavelength filters. Now, all these series of images all depict the same flaring process that happened, but depict the plasma which are in, uh, at different, different temperatures. Uh, all these images are taken by the SDO instrument, uh, the AIA instrument on SDO spacecraft, which was launched in 2010. Now, this is a very important way of studying what happens in the sun, and it's precise. And we can do this precisely because the sun is uh, pretty close, and we can collect this kind of rich data. Uh, and and by studying the plasma, which are at different different temperatures, basically we can trace down the energy processes which is which are powering the, this process in the first place. Uh, in addition, whatever uh, different plasma temperatures, the plasma might be in, you have to combine it with uh, measurements from other uh, wavelengths, for example, X-ray and radio. Uh, for example, the radio information and the X-ray information give information about particle acceleration. Um, so when you combine different, different wavelengths uh, and look at the same processes uh, that happen at the sun, what you can see is you can build up a complete picture. Uh, so in this particular flare, you can see these others are using uh, UV, uh, X-ray, as well as radio. So in combination, uh, you can see how the magnetic field line came closer, how it was the how the reconnection happened, then how the particle acceleration happened, and how the resulting uh, magnetic energy, uh, uh, which then accelerated particles and heated up the plasma resulted in multi-thermal plasma and how then the plasma cooled down uh, heating up the corona. So this whole processes can be tracked by looking at a flare in, in, in multi wavelength mode. Now, the problem with this is, uh, as I said before, uh, this is possible only for big flares. For small flares of the kind that we are interested in, uh, the, the current sensitivity limits of the instrument won't enable us to uh, detect that uh, the, the small flare beyond the thermal continuum. Um, so this slide basically shows the rich uh, variety of uh, spacecraft and instruments that we have dedicated to study just the sun. Um, and here, and that is the reason why uh, we use radio to study the sun. Um, and the solar radio emission can happen either in, in coherent mode or coherent mode. In coherent mode, the plasma is basically aligned with the magnetic field line. And the, uh, because of the different plasma condition that exists in different parts of the sun, different uh, emission modes are observed which is shown in this particular figure. Uh, and uh, we kind of named them according to the order in which they were discovered in the first place. So type one emission, uh, which I'll come very soon, uh, come back very soon, uh, is the most dominant form of emission. They're the most common. Uh, and type three emission, they're like very fast drifting radio bursts that we observe. Mm. 
and type 4 emission and type 2 emission history of those maybe right after a stop wave trend. So all these wave modes carry rich information about the local plasma condition. And because this form of emission is coherent, uh, uh, even so, there might be very small population of non-thermal electrons which actually generate this emission because the coherent nature of this emission, uh, it results in a very high brightness temperature and they are easily observable. So these small flares that we might miss with the current instruments uh, are easily observed, at least theoretically, uh, using the radio wave. So to study the small scale energy uh, uh, acceleration processes, it is very important that we use the help of radio uh, to study. Uh, forward, uh, so this equation that you see is the most important equation, which says the uh, radio frequency of the emission is dependent on the local electron uh, density. And what this enables us is if we track the radio emission, we can as well say, from which layer of the sun the emission was coming from. So basically we can track an accelerated uh, electron all the way from different layers of the sun to near Earth. Uh, to emphasize this point, um, I will show a picture of a, uh, picture of the work that I have done. Um, uh, so don't worry about the topmost layer. So this is basically uh, the light curves of hard X-rays and soft X-rays. Um, uh, so please focus your attention on the uh, this blue panel here, which shows the emitted radio wave uh, drifting across the frequency space uh, towards the Earth. And why is it towards the Earth? Because you can see the the, the radio wave is drifting uh, and, and getting reduced in uh, the frequency. What it shows is the electron are traveling uh, through the interplanetary medium, and because the density falls away as we move further from the sun, this basically signifies the accelerated electron traveling all the way from the sun to near Earth. And the bottom panel actually is the particle flux. So uh, from from the AC fan instrument. Uh, so the, uh, in the in the beginning of the flare, which ha happens, there there is no significant rise in the particle flux. And as time goes by, the uh, particles which were actually produced at the acceleration side of the sun uh, and tracked by this type 3 burst uh, uh, travels through the interplanetary medium, arrives near the spacecraft, and with the right of this flight that you see in the bottom panel. So, the whole process is uh, uh, visualized in this particular graphic. So, uh, there might be a small flare here, and of course, you need access to an open magnetic field line. The particles are then accelerated along this, uh, which are accelerated, get access to this open magnetic field line, and they travel emitting type 3 bursts. Uh, and later, they are detected at any spacecraft, uh, and we can do further study. So, this is one way of using radio. The, but the kind of radio emission that I would like to talk about, and maybe particularly important to study the small scale event, is that of type 1 storm. Now, as I said before, type 1 noise storms are the most dominant form of emission in, in uh, solar radio spectrum. And they were the original ones to be discovered in the first place. And one interesting history is that because the type 1 noise storms have this uh, tendency to jam radio frequencies, uh, during World War II, the, uh, it, it was a very puzzling phenomenon for the military planners. So, Back then, we didn't know the sun was capable of emitting radio emission. So, uh, and and because it was the advent of uh, radar technology at the Second World War, many times the British uh, uh, soldiers observed that they can't track the enemy planes because there was a powerful solar radio noise from happening in the sun. So, uh, the solar radio astronomy got a big emphasis uh, just because humanity wanted to track enemy planes. Now, in, in type 1 emission, what you see is there is a broadband continuum, which is noted by this dashed line. 
uh, and on top of this broadband continuum you see very narrow uh, narrow band frequency bursts superposed now each of these bursts signify a tiny acceleration event happening at the sun now we don't have an exact clue regarding how what exactly is powering this cyclone emission but what we think is happening is on top of this active region uh, there are many magnetic fields like which form like a loop uh, and there is a jungle of them and because all of them are like uh, moving uh, in tandem with each other because of the cyclone motion the plasma down below they all interconnect uh basically it's something small small reconnection and somehow this results results in a self sustaining processes uh emitting type 1 radio noise storm uh so because type 1 noise storms are like examples of the small scale acceleration events they are very important to understand how small scale acceleration events actually power coronal heating so uh what you see here is basically uh, an imaging of type 1 noise storm uh, done by Murphy um, et al uh, where they combined the GMRT telescope near pune and the nanser radio seismograph which is basically the instrument uh, here at the tyre observatory uh, they combined both these instruments now using a technique called radio interferometry and uh, form these images now uh, why it is important is just using the sensitivities of gmrt or radio data or, or nrh sorry uh, we will not be able to uh, obtain this sharp image uh, this is this snapshot image in this um now uh, this shows the promise uh, of using radio uh, measurement to study in detail uh, the different noise storm uh, emitting region now this still now this is the uh, most higher spatial resolution images of the radio noise storm that we know now with the upcoming uh, radio telescope like lopar and ska we uh, imagine this uh, spatial resolution will go up in many orders of magnitude but as of now this shows theoretically what is possible by combining different different regions now for my study what i was interested in is basically quantifying the energy that might be outputted in a single burst now uh, usually it is a little tricky to estimate the energy output uh, from a, a radio burst mostly because it is uh, rather vague how we uh, determine the uh, energy efficiency process um so what we did is we created uh, a, a An algorithm which can detect these individual bursts from this atom continuum, and extract these individual bursts, and form histograms of this. So this, uh, it is, uh, and and from these histograms, we can find out an average uh, representative quantity for each of these bursts that happened uh, in, in in a noise storm. Now, using this quantity. and using a general fermi second acceleration mechanism that uh just have developed uh, uh we were able to quantify uh the energy contained in a representative burst so this equation that you see here is actually uh, basically the not the time evolution of green function uh in uh, and and the, we assume the electron is basically uh accelerated in multiple multiple magnetic uh, scattering centers and the first term here on the left hand side is the diffusion of momentum and the second side is basically the injection of electron at a particular momentum and the last term is the uh, escape term so electron cannot stay in a scattering center for long it has to escape so this term signifies that now the solution for this uh, uh this state solution for this particular green function is a uh, power law like this now the only quantities that we need to quantify this power law are this exponent alpha one alpha two and the diffusion coefficient d no so using the observations of the real noise storms that we uh, we conducted and the histograms that we generated 
uh, from the individual words that you observe. Uh, we defined alpha 1, alpha, and alpha 2 as the observed quantities that were actually measured in this noise storm. By doing so, what we were able to do is that we were able to understand energy content in this world, the amount of the ratio between non-thermal electrons to that are thermal electrons, and uh, the average the, uh, energy in an accelerated electron population. Electron population in a world. So, if you look at the table below, what you will see is the uh, numbers that we found uh, in maybe a per second is around 10 to the power 24 um, or like 10 to the power 22 Earth per second. Now, theoretically, if uh, this proves that if these kind of tiny, tiny accelerations are happening across the sun, this would be representative of a nano flare storm happening across the sun. Now, we know you know, type 1 noise storms are produced only from active region. So, what we hope to raise is that because these type 1 noise storms are very uh, representative of small scale acceleration events happening across the sun as postulated by Parker, uh, and because these events produce enough energy to account for uh, heating, uh, we we uh, uh, postulate that this kind of event would be able to be detected with the upcoming much more uh, finer resolution radio telescope like LOPAR and SKA. And that forms my future work that I'm doing here. So what I'm doing here is basically uh, two uh, twofold. So one is basically uh, using the existing measurements uh, and uh, Paris Observatory traditionally has been in the forefront of uh, solar radio astronomy. Uh, it was a, a first observatory in the world to actually establish uh, uh, radio astronomy studies for uh, solar physics. Uh, and Nancy Radio Geograph is a very uh, powerful and modern instrument which was recently updated um, uh, to study the sun. So, using the already observed data from Nancy Radio Geograph, we are undertaking a very uh, Details uh, survey of type 1 noise storm to understand how these noise storms evolve across a solar uh, cycle. And the second one uh, is actually using modern instruments, for example, LOPAR, to uh, do much more finer imaging and spectral uh, studies of the type 1 noise storm. Uh, by doing so, what uh, we uh, imagine is that we'd be able to quantify the parameters that I displayed in the previous slide in a much more finer detail and we will be actually be able to uh, image them uh, and uh, see them happening uh, across uh, um, across the active region so that we will be able to actually understand how an accelerated beam of electrons behave in a typical type of noise numbers. So this is a work in progress um, uh, and the data collection, some of it uh, is already happened, some of it is to happen, uh, so um, uh, we are hoping for the best. So that concludes the work part of my presentation. Now I understand this is also a talk where I uh, share my journey because uh, when I uh, started out, uh, started my research career uh, as a PhD student, I knew nothing about uh, any of this. I just knew I wanted to do astrophysics. Um, so when I did my bachelor's, like I was like dead sure I wanted to do astrophysics. But uh, back at ISER, and this is one of the strengths of ISER, I was given a chance to uh, basically mix and match. Uh, so for the first year of my PhD, and after that, I actually worked with Tumakan Bakol uh, in his called Atom uh, lab. Uh, trying to make the UC. Um, so it was, it was fun, it was a lot of fun, but at, by the end of first year, I was sure that my future lies in astrophysics. And then I uh, uh, moved to work with Prasad Subhanian, and it's been a long and rewarding journey since then. So, what I would like to say is that, I mean, you, you are a title and you have like multiple uh, choices to form your research career. So definitely mix and match. Uh, and so really, as you um, can imagine, it's a multi-field field. So uh, you, you can uh, definitely
personally uh, have your uh, interest for astrophysics but don't just study astrophysics try to experiment with other fields try to gain uh, knowledge from other fields and more often than not what i've seen is uh, the information or the skill that you learn from the other field is directly applicable in astrophysics because astrophysics is always goes to the cutting edge of whatever is available to us so new techniques and new data analysis methods and new ways of uh, uh, measurements are constantly being improved in astrophysics and skills that you learn in, in other fields are very important for the journey another fact is uh, being in pune you are close to one of the two top notch institutes in astrophysics in the country which is iuka and ncra so there are a lot of opportunities to do uh, uh, research projects and short term uh, internship uh, so definitely is that uh, again within astrophysics there are multiple fields mix and match there as well uh, do radio astronomy do optical astronomy do x ray astronomy all these are important and as i said before just in uh, theory of physics uh, just to understand what is in the solar flare you need to look at minimum five different wavelengths and these five different wavelengths result because of different different physical processes uh, and and to actually gain an understanding of what how the solar flare for example is powered to you need to understand a rich amount of physics and actually know how the measurements are actually made so because the way you measure uh, or do radio astronomy is completely different from the way you do x ray astronomy or like uv astronomy or optical astronomy so uh, so throughout your five years uh, i and i think most of you guys are bsms students so throughout your five years uh, try as many different different fields as possible before settling into your final academic year to project um, and make use of um and my ending slide would be uh, an inspiring uh, one as to why you should definitely take up astronomy and astrophysics uh, it's mostly because um, a very exciting time is ahead of us uh, because of the advancements in technology be it measurements be it instrumentation uh, we are going to find answers to many difficult questions that we had no clue about Uh, or we had no means to answer in the past 10 years so ska which is a square kilometer array is coming up uh, soon uh, to begin construction we hope the james webb telescope will be launched next year the 30 meter telescope already coming in construction and not to say instruments uh, you also need uh, advancements in space physics to actually build this you need advancements in transport technology to actually launch this for example the james webb telescope is Uh, around uh, 6500 uh, kilograms uh, now that is limited by the actual uh, uh, transport technologies that we have uh, for launch for example ariane 5 uh, we can launch only that much uh, limited uh, kilograms in the space at a time now space ship which i hope to be successful soon can transfer maybe 100 tons to leo that is lower earth orbit now imagine the kind of space crafts and facilities that can be in space to take measurements uh, with such a technology um, and and the the right most image is that of the summit uh, supercomputer uh, because astrophysics is all about managing the data daily this sk this quite kilometer array uh, is will soon produce data at the rate of maybe 1 tb per second now how will you manage that kind of data how will you find information from that kind of data you need uh, simultaneous advancements in algorithms data management data structures and even efficient use of computational power because uh, uh, no current algorithm might be able to handle 1 tb per second of data or like later even load up that kind of data into memory so um, all these things combined the advancements in instrumentation space technology and computational power means we are in a position to answer much much more profound questions than that was possible 10 years ago and people who would graduate and become young astrophysicists in the next uh, 5 to 10 years 
they have a great future ahead of themselves because uh, the uh, many opportunities to uh, uh, to to master different different uh, branches of knowledge and uh, combine all of them together and solve many interesting questions in the universe. So uh, all the best, and with that, I will uh, end my talk. So I'm open for questions. Yeah, thanks a lot for this interesting talk. Um, so uh, people can start asking questions. They can unmute or put them in the chat box uh, and ask him anything you all want. Um, you can stop sharing and check the chat box. There are a couple of questions over there. Okay, so the first question is, are these nano flares different from the solar flares? To be honest, we don't know, but we have reason to believe they kind of follow the same morphology. Um, now, we have something that we call uh, the standard flare model. Um, so this is basically purely empirical, as in like we don't have, a, uh, I mean, we have theoretical understanding, but it's not like, we don't know exactly how each of these uh, individual processes form or something. But purely from empirical viewpoint, we have constructed a model called the standard plan model, which uh, which basically depicts like how uh, the plasma is heated up and how the plasma is transported across magnetic field lines and how magnetic field lines come together and how reconnection happens and finally how the release of the energy happens. Um, uh, so we believe nano flares might follow some of it at least, uh, but because we don't have any direct observation of a nano flare happening, we don't know. But one of the studies that I have conducted uh, uh, looked at uh, micro flares, which are like one plus above nano flares, uh, and looked at how the energy, uh, the acceleration processes powering this micro flares actually happen. Now what we found was the number of electrons that actually produce this uh, radiation or the energy. So it is much more, uh, the ratio of the uh, uh, electrons to that of energy is much more compared to a uh, big flares, which basically means maybe micro flares are much more efficient accelerators of electrons than maybe a big flare. Uh, uh, but these are again, uh, this, this is again an open question. Uh, now with the new instrument, we would be able to detect much uh, more number of nano flares, and we would be able to maybe understand if nano flares uh, they have a different morphology, or maybe they are just a small counterpart of big solar flares that we observe. Um, so yes, that is a square kilometer array on the top left. Yes, that is an artist's condition. So they will start construction in the next six months is what I call. So exciting time. Um, so how was your experience of IPSG going to die first? Uh, it was pretty nice. Uh, so again, we were like among the first batches of IPSG at ICO. Uh, actually, I was the second batch. Uh, so there were a lot of experimentation. I believe a lot of those things are settled now. We have much more clarity regarding the coursework. We have much more clarity regarding, you know, the number of other bureaucratic stuff that needs to do that needs to be done. Um, so, uh, in my case at least, um, the IPSD coursework was just leading. Uh, so we shared a lot of our coursework with the ESMS students. Uh, but now there are, uh, uh, I, I believe there are there are discussions regarding setting up a new IPSD curriculum which would be a little more advanced than that of the student. students. Uh, and I, I actually don't know the latest updates on that. Uh, but in general, I can, I, I really have personal experience to say about IPSD course. One major advantage of IPSD course is uh, definitely the research experience that you might be able to get. Because in my in my, in my case, for example, uh, I only knew I wanted to watch it. I had no uh, research experience in that from my uh, that was cool. So after coming to ICER, I was able to experiment with the cold magnetic lab, 
uh, maybe take some skills in instrumentation and then come back and work with you. So such kind of uh, things are possible in PSB, but then much more difficult to do. So I PSB that way given uh, gives you that advantage. Um, yep. Yeah. Challenges, I can promise you there will be plenty, uh, mostly because you will be entering a new field and all of this thing initially would look like a, a alien language to you. Uh, you need to first understand and how much of a theory you actually read, you will never understand a thing for the data unless you actually play with the data. So it takes some time. Uh, so, uh, and I, I was a observational. Uh, I, I did my uh, thesis on observational metaphysics mostly uh, and very little theory, but I use theory to quantify many of my particular. Uh, but then again, in my case at least, it was very important for me to actually play with the data, understand the data, uh, and uh, uh, gain an experience on uh, and data handling. So, uh, yeah, I can promise you many challenges to be there. But just be persistent and just be uh, playful with the uh, work that uh, you are going to do. Uh, trial and error, and definitely you will find yourself there. Um, Prasad, um, I mean, I was really lucky to have him as a guide. Uh, so, very kind, very understanding, brilliant guide, uh, very understanding, and he gave me my space to basically uh, understand the typical concept that is there. So uh, yeah, it was uh, real fun to work with him. Uh, so if you're interested in working with him, I would definitely encourage you to go talk to him, discuss your ideas, uh, possibilities. And then good thing with Prasad is like, uh, he's not just a solar physics guy. Actually, he did his PhD in black hole plasma physics. So he's actually a plasma physicist. So your options uh, of, of uh, doing a PhD with him is not just solar physics, but if you're interested in theoretical understanding of solar, uh, plasma physics, then that is a possibility. For example, one, if, if one of his grad students is combining uh, the processes that we know how CMEs are powered on the sun to, uh, and using that knowledge to understand how radio jets are powered. So, very interesting work. Yes, I took six years to complete my uh, IPSD, uh, but yeah, so it varies. I've seen people uh, on average completing in around six years. Uh, I would say just enjoy the process. If you worry too much about the time it takes, uh, you will not enjoy the process. Um, new ad advice for IPSD students uh, just starting out would be, as I said, um don't settle on a field as, uh, early in, very early in your career uh, try to gain experiences and uh, try to gain an understanding how like usually how things work in different fields of astronomy and astronomy and then settle for one and uh, um i can only say regarding uh, experiences experiences regarding observational astrophysics uh, read, be thorough about the instrumentation part. So what I've observed is people uh, are just happy to just collect the data and not understand the actual instrument is collecting the data. And that's a big mistake. Um, so uh, when you are doing observational astrophysics, you need to be an instrumentalist as well. So you need to understand uh, the physics that actually enables the collection of uh, data by this, by this measurement, by this instrument, be thorough with that, and that will definitely help you better in understanding the actual data that you're working with. What band of light? So SK is basically a radio uh, observatory. It's going to be the most advanced radio observatory ever built by IT. Uh, so it will give us optical light kind of resolution uh, to many of the astrophysical modes. Uh, we know. Uh, so there are uh, two parts to it. Uh, like, uh, so one one part of SK is built in uh, Australia, and other part in South Africa. Uh, so uh, both these parts are going to come in different different 
phasing. So the uh, first phase of the construction will happen in the next six months of time. Begin construction. I expect it to three first lights in maybe uh, 2025 or something like that. Uh, but even before SA, uh, we uh, already have many advanced, very cool, awesome radio observatories throughout the world. An interesting fact is that many of these radio observatories are undergoing uh, upgradation. LOFAR is going uh, through upgradations, including its sensitivity. Uh, VLA is going, GMRT, I think you already commissioned with this new GMRT, upgraded GMRT. So even the, uh, the existing radio sensitivities are um, uh, really awesome, I would say. So uh, when it comes in, uh, it's possible uh, to do uh, radio astronomy project using the already existing data to get a feel to it. Um, so I think that those are the questions that I can see on the chat box. So I would be happy to take any other specific questions as well. Yeah, people can also unmute to ask or put them in the chat box. Uh, so how is your experience abroad so far? It's good, it's good. I mean, uh, this year has been pretty weird uh, because of this lockdown and everything. But in general, um, uh, again, I can only talk uh, in specific uh, to the work that I am doing because um, Paris Observatory traditionally has been a major uh, partner in, in, in setting up solar radio astronomy field. Uh, there's a rich history and a lot of experts also available here to help out with uh, different things. So uh, that way it is good. But um, general rule of thumb is that uh, before going anywhere, uh, thoroughly research about the existing uh, work done by that group, try to maybe contact people who already work with the group to understand how the dynamics are, and um, yeah, um, try it up, try different, different uh, things. So you cannot say in general about anything about working in India or working abroad. Um, so, uh, I can say positive experiences from my uh, my experiences here, uh, but uh, it cannot be you know generalized. You need to find out for yourself. So that's what I said. So use your DSM viewers as an experimentation platform. Try to find as many research internships as possible. Try to work with different different groups because it's not just enough to be uh, you know a diligent. A student, you need to be also be a good communicator. You need to understand how to work with different group members, how to communicate your results, how to uh, say your needs. You know, all those are very important for a successful uh, astrophysicist because astrophysicists always work in a group, big group, and, uh, because all these uh, projects involve uh, very high technology and very high amount of funding. So it's impossible for a single astrophysicist to do some anything worthwhile. So there will be like you'll be like part of big group, and communication is a very important part of this big group. So uh, try uh, work with different different groups, gain an experience, uh, and you can use the skill set throughout your life. So as a postdoctoral fellow, do you have any uh, teaching responsibilities or TA responsibilities? Um, no, because uh, I am working uh, uh, in a, an observatory. Uh, now, Paris Observatory has its own master teaching curriculum, but then uh, it's in French, so usually they don't ask uh, non-French speaking people to uh, do that. And also the, the master course is like pretty self-contained and uh, not done in an observation in a university setting, but um, postdocs, depending upon where they actually work, they might be asked to do teaching responsibilities. So I know my friends who are based in uh, big universities as a, as a postdoctoral fellow, they have to teach the courses their, their supervisors are giving, or um, 
maybe just to uh, fulfill some of their post doctoral commitments, they will have to be, they will have to teach some courses or do PhD or something like that. But for me, uh, it is very specific case because it's an observatory and we don't have a, a university setting here. Uh, I don't have to teach. There is a question in the chat box. Ah, yes. Um, AI solutions, again, um, it is closely related with the kind of data deluge that is going to happen soon. Because uh, uh, people are still experimenting regarding uh, the possible means of using AI uh, in, in astrophysics. Uh, one major uh, area where a lot of research work is happening is finding transients because uh, most often the data that you collect is just pure noise. So, uh, for example, in my case, let's say if I'm observing the sun, um, the events of interest happen maybe uh, once per day, depending upon which event that I'm looking at. So, what happens to all the other data that I've been collecting? Uh, so I need a reliable way of detecting just this transient, just this interesting uh, piece of event, and have to throw out all the other data because the data that using the modern the, the modern instruments that give out is pretty big. Uh, so uh, there is no way I can store all this data for all these days and actually do anything worthwhile with it. So um, one major task that uh, one major project that I am part of is actually using maybe computational computer, computer vision algorithms like uh, CNN and all to detect radio bursts. So uh, if you can reliably, reliably uh, detect a radio burst happening at a particular time, you can just store that particular part and uh, throw away uh, the other part which is not needed. Uh, but there are uh, many uh, uh, different avenues in which astrophysicists use AI. Um, one thing I can, I, I don't know if you know this, but uh, there is a lot of research work in, in exoplanet uh, research uh, on the same detection of transient data and uh, uh, even uh, uh, the upcoming uh, radio astronomy facilities like SKA because of the pure volume of the data that is going to be generated. Lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of talk regarding using AI to maybe filter out radio frequency interference, which is a major problem for radio observations. So um, there are no clear cut uh, clear cut answers as to what are the limitations of AI uh, within astrophysics. People are still experimenting. We have some success. For example, uh, there are uh, many trees which uh, uh, say much easier to do AI to uh, account for missing data and such kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's a very promising fusion of uh, two fields, AI and natural fields. Yep, yes, um, definitely. I know many uh, astrophysicists uh, who became masters of data analysis, basically big data analysis, because you need big data analysis skills to manage the kind of data that is uh, coming from this instrument. Uh, now, once you uh, master that, definitely there, may, there will be many opportunities for you as well. In fact, one interesting uh, fusion that's happening is uh, the tech companies, because they are they have to be ready for, to handle the kind of data per second that SKA would use, they're already partnering with SKA to develop algorithms, to develop chips, to develop storage solutions so that they can be ready. So the current internet traffic is not up to the level uh, of what SKA would do, but it would be the next one decade or two decades. So they need to be ready by the time internet traffic reaches that particular level so that they can uh, handle that. So, uh, so they are using SKA as a playground uh, to understand uh, and maybe experiment and develop technologies which can uh, handle this kind of data. And the same goes with astrophysics as well. So let's say you you, you develop an algorithm um, to handle the kind of data that maybe one 
that terabyte of data per second or something like that. There would be many takers for that in, in industry. And um, yeah, sky is the limit in that. So um, the, uh, as I said, like an actual business is very important. You, need, you, you, you receive training in, in different fields. You need to be uh, a good computer scientist. You need to be a good physicist. You need to be a good data analyst to be a successful actor. Um, I think we can stop if there aren't any more questions. I'll stop the recording at least. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm.